like to welcome you all to one of the series of lectures sponsored by the Institute of Politics and the Harvard Summer School, part of their summer 1982 lecture series. I'm Mary Jo Bain. I'm on the faculty of the Kennedy School of Government, which shares this building with the Institute of Politics, uh, and I'm going to moderate this uh, debate. Uh, the topic tonight is Reaganomics. Uh, we have one for and one against, or so I'm told. Uh, and our, our two panelists will, will take on the various dimensions of the, of the issue uh, and I suspect raise some, interesting, raise some interesting questions. The basic format will be that each of the, of the two participants will have 15 minutes to make an opening statement. We'll then give them each five minutes to respond to each other so that they can pick up the points that, that they have made and we'll then open it up to the floor for, for questions uh, and going back and forth and so on. Uh, so that will be the general format, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, our two panelists tonight are, are George Gilder and Bob Kuttner. George Gilder, who will be the first speaker, uh, told me before we, we came out here that I should introduce him as a, a, a one-time student at Harvard, uh, who had a miserable record. Is that what you No, that's not what you said. Uh, who enjoyed his time at Harvard greatly, uh, who is the author, among other things, of the book uh, Wealth and Poverty, which is his most recent book, also, also the author of many others, including Sexual Suicide. Uh, I was also told that uh, uh, recently President Reagan gave Wealth and Poverty to Senator Bob Dole, uh, which was a high point of the book. I also thought a high point of the book was, uh, David Stockman, I believe, said it was Promethe a Promethean insight, which I thought was a splendid title. Uh, so uh, George Gilder will start off the debate tonight. It's all yours. Yeah, that uh, Promethean really got to me. I was uh, I was been thinking about it, and it it's quite became quite popular around OMB as time passed. They started talking about Promethean meals, and and that was a really Promethean breath breakfast, and it really began going downhill as uh, Stockman's uh, problems increased. Uh, uh, you know, Dole. Uh, I used to write speeches for Dole, and uh, I really. Uh, think that Reagan could have spared the trouble. You know, the very idea of, uh, re of uh, Bob Dole reading a book is, uh, <laughs> is rather Promethean. <laughs> and, uh, and the idea, and uh, I mean, I, when I was ri writing speeches, it was the 1976 vice presidential campaign, and I couldn't even get him to read my speeches, uh, which uh, uh, he didn't uh, therefore uh, reach the high office he was seeking at the time, which, uh, which might be just as well because he always said he only wanted to be vice president because it offered indoor work with no heavy lifting. And, uh, and I th it would have been better to have him uh, vice president, I think, than uh, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, which involved a lot of heavy lifting and uh, must have sprained his brain, I think, but uh, judging from his uh, recent tax proposals. Well, uh, defending, defending the uh, Reaganomics and its current uh, great successes, I feel a little, little like the young boy who had to go to uh, his first dance uh, and his mother told him, above all, as you walk off the floor, be sure to say something nice to every girl you dance with. And uh, the, first, uh, the first one was a, a huge girl who, uh, stepped on his toes repeatedly for 15 minutes, and as he walked off the floor, he turned to her after co really combing his brain and says, said, you don't sweat too much for a fat girl. <laughs> well, I've just come up from the White House yesterday, and I'm, I'm afraid I can't say so much for the Reagan administration. They're sweating pretty bad for uh, somebody just elected with uh, such a fat uh, majority. But the chief cause of the sweat, I think, is a general incomprehension of, uh, and of uh, Reaganomics and of the purposes and uh, assumptions of the administration and uh, an implacable hostility toward what they're trying to do from, from the press and uh, from the media. They still talk about huge tax cuts, for example, well, uh, and somehow ascribe our current problems to the huge tax cuts that uh, the that supposedly have occurred in the last couple years. Well, what actually happened in 1981 was that once again in pursuit of the grail of a balanced budget, 
Congress deferred the tax cut, which was uh, proposed for January, on into October and cut it in half to 5%, uh, which uh, translated to one and a quarter percent for a whole year, and uh, which was just overwhelmed by the tax increases, which were then underway for Social Security and, for, uh, and through bracket creep, the effect of inflation pushing taxpayers into higher brackets without any increase in their real purchasing power. So what happened in 1981 actually was a huge tax increase. Uh, the, to get an idea of its dimensions, uh, you have to understand that GNP rose about $225 billion in 1981, nominally, and uh, taxes rose $114 billion, which uh, meant an effective marginal rate for the economy of 52%, which was the highest uh, uh, proportion in a decade. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, and uh, for most taxpayers, uh, the taxes rose about 10%. Tax rates rose about 10% for the average taxpayer in 1981. The problem that the economy faces is not some profound incompatibility between a restrained monetary policy and a supply-side policy. It was uh, the continuation of the monetary policy launched under the Carter administration uh, without any effective application of uh, supply-side policy so that uh, we got all the restraint and none of the stimulus and the result was the, was the problems we face today. Uh, that's one of the causes. I mean, I think that uh, uh, the root cause is that we're currently going through a worldwide recession. Even uh, Japan's economy is only growing about 3% now, and virtually all other economies are stagnant. It's a worldwide problem which uh, has uh, uh, heavily impacted the Reagan administration. Uh, the Mitterrand, who did a, an opposite experiment in France where he Im imposed a surtax and a wealth tax uh, last year, has uh, had even worse economic results, although uh, uh, in general the French economy has been much stronger, uh, at least uh, uh, statistically, than the U.S. economy in recent years. The, uh, Industrial production in France dropped 8%, and uh, inflation remained at 13.5%. And so uh, this, has been, this has been a, gener a general predicament for economies, and uh, the Reagan administration was uh, caught in this, uh, this uh, worldwide recession. The other uh, uh, proposition about supply-side economics that's widely uh, brooded about is somehow we are in favor of deficits that, uh, and indeed we're uh, producing a huge deficit as a result of the uh, tax cuts. Uh, the fact is that the deficit, even uh, presuming the projections of the Congressional Budget Office will be about this, uh, will be less than it was in 1975 and 1976, far smaller than deficits in recent years and in uh, Germany and Japan, which has uh, run the largest deficits of all. And the real problem is not the size of the deficits, but the uh, pathetic levels of savings in the United States. And one of the great problems is you cannot, uh, raising taxes uh, uh, almost invariably reduces savings as much as dollar for dollar so that uh, all these proposals to overcome the current deficit problem by further tax increases will necessarily fail. That is indeed the policy which has been followed for the last uh, decade. It was followed uh, steadily under President Carter, allowing taxes to rise year after year in uh, pursuit of a balanced budget. And he actually achieved it in 1979. Uh, the, in effect, the budget was balanced in 1979 if you include state and local surpluses, but the uh, uh, result was a collapse of personal savings to the lowest level in 30 years and uh, a doubling of interest rates and a doubling of inflation. Uh, so that uh, this great achievement of virtually balancing the budget by raising taxes in uh, 1979 was a catastrophe, not a uh, not a success, and I hope we don't uh, repeat this uh, error again as uh, Congress seems to be contemplating at the moment. But perhaps the worst misconception about uh, Reaganomics, uh, which is just 
insistently propagated in the media is the idea that uh, it's widening the gap between the rich and the poor, that somehow tax cuts across the board redistribute income from the poor to the rich, that uh, somehow uh, supply-side economics uh, favors the rich and uh, crea creates uh, a less egalitarian distribution of income, a less dynamic uh, uh, economy of, in terms of opportunities. But uh, the fact is that uh, tax cuts across the board always increase the tax payments of the rich. In every case, they always have and they always will because uh, the rich have mobile money. It's the poor have their, uh, the poor and middle class have their taxes withheld at source. It's usually withheld from their salary. So therefore, uh, you cut uh, taxes across the board and the poor and middle class actually pays less. The rich, however, have mobile money. Uh, they, uh, and uh, you don't get rich uh, in America, in most countries, by being stupid. And uh, if you aren't stupid and you face mar rising marginal tax rates, which have, have uh, 55, 56 percent, it's uh, worth your while to spend most of your time trying to figure out ways to avoid them. And invariably, since uh, the rich aren't stupid, they do figure out ways to avoid them. They, uh, 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 and as a result, we, um, we uh, precipitated what was the really biggest booming industry of the, of the 1970s. Which was the tax shelter industry. You know, there's uh, from triple net real estate leases to 1031 real estate swaps to Cayman Island shuffles to porno film, uh, uh, porno films and race horses and box cars. It just tremendous array of uh, of tax shelters emerged during that decade, and uh, the re result was that uh, uh, tax increases. Uh, don't redistribute income. They're designed to redistribute income, but what they do, in fact, is redistribute taxpayers. And they redistribute taxpayers out of productive activities in the uh, real economy into offshore tax havens and unproductive of uh, pedophagy and, uh, and uh, counting finagles, the whole array of uh, legal and uh, accounting activities which preoccupy most of the rich in an overtaxed economy. And uh, so, and uh, this isn't just uh, an empty pr proposition. This is demonstrable in every, uh, after every uh, across the board tax cut. The rich pay more and the poor pay less. In the 1920s, for example, uh, the uh, share of, uh, they really had a real tax cut. It was, a, the top rate was dropped from 74% to 25%. And uh, the result was that the share of total taxes paid by the rich rose from 28% to 61%. Total revenues rose uh, 58%. And the actual taxes paid by the rich rose almost 200%. Well, that was in the 1920s. In 1964, we had another tax cut. It was more modest than, uh, it, was, uh, more, it was larger than the Reagan administration tax cut. In, uh, compressed over two years rather than three, but it was a substantial tax cut. And the result was taxpayers in brackets over $100,000 increased their payments by 80%. Well, in 1981, we did have one tax cut for one group of taxpayers. The top rate on unearned income dropped from 70 to 50. That was the only really significant tax cut uh, that uh, occurred in 1981. And that, uh, and that has already uh, increased the share of total taxes paid by the rich from 29% to 31% during the first four months of this year. Between September 81 and May 82, tax receipts from estimated tax rose 13%, uh, which was uh, uh, a very unexpected development, unanticipated by anybody in the administration. Estimated taxes are, are almost entirely uh, paid by the by the rich, as it's said, and uh, and these uh, and these tax payments, which are uh, are uh, uh, a pretty good proxy for payments by the rich, and uh, they went up 13 percent. So al already uh, the 
one real tax cut we've had as having the predicted effect. And, uh, and the result is the, the rich are paying more rather than less. And uh, this is exactly what uh, supply-side economists would predict. But perhaps the worst assumption is that somehow cutting back on our array of social programs that have uh, uh, tripled in uh, real terms in uh, three, two decades, and uh, triple in, in during the 1970s, is somehow uh, hostile to the real interests of the poor. What really has happened in 1981 is the total collapse of the dream of liberal social policy. Uh, what the latest 19, the 81, the latest census figures show that the illegitimacy rate among blacks in America at this point has risen to 55% of all births. 55%. This is a total catastrophe that is directly attributable to 20 years of liberal social policy directed precisely into the, into the ghettos. And liberals will do anything to deny this. And as a result, they will persist in intensifying and perpetuating poverty on into, on into future decades if they uh, regain control of social policy. Uh, this uh, total destruction virtually of uh, the black family in the inner cities uh, is, is a great mystery to social scientists. As a matter of fact, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said uh, it, it may be beyond the analytical capability of social science to comprehend this development. Well, I, I, as I said, I, I was at, at Harvard and, uh, and uh, I did pretty well, actually. People th have questioned my credentials to talk about economics, but uh, at, uh, judging from my performance at Harvard, what they don't understand is I took Act One not once, but twice. <laughs> and, uh, and the second time I passed it. So, uh, so it really, uh, but uh, so uh, not being burdened with uh, social science degrees, I can explain what actually happened, particularly since I spent three years uh, actually interviewing the poor, which is uh, something that uh, in preparation for writing uh, my last book called v a Visible Man. And uh, what, what caused this uh, catastrophe is, uh, and this particular dimension of it, is uh, the Imagine that you're a poor black girl in the middle of a uh, ghetto situation, crime, addiction, demoralization, your mother is struggling with your brothers and kids, and uh, your f a father is rarely around, there's a succession of men, there's a lot of violence, it's, a, it's an unpleasant and horrible situation. And uh, what do you, uh, and, uh, but the government offers a deal. You can get out of all that. You can have an apartment of your own. You can have access to 17 social programs, which collectively are worth virtually the uh, median income in the United States. All if you do one thing, you qualify as truly needy, as everybody uh, is continually saying. And how do you get to be truly needy? Well, a lot of experience has, has told the uh, people in the American uh, slums, what it takes to be truly needy. It's to be a woman with a kid. And, uh, and uh, they've been doing that because the government has demanded it. And it's now reached the point of total catastrophe. It's a, a poverty is worse than it's been in the last 25 years as a result of this orgy of social policy. And uh, this is, this is the, the uh, essence of the, of the, of the predicament. Uh, so the cutbacks in these programs are long past due and will ultimately make possible the expansion of the economy even into the, uh, to the American poor. Is that, uh, thank you. Maybe some questions as we move on. Um, is this mic on? So our second participant tonight is, is Bob Kuttner, uh, who is the editor of Working Papers, uh, which is a magazine I assume you all read. Uh, he is also the author of The Revolt of the Haves. Before coming to Working Papers, he was chief investigator for the Senate Banking Committee and has also been a reporter for the Washington Post. Uh, Bob is a former fellow of the Institute of Politics, as George Gilder also is. 
Uh, so we have a panel tonight with two former fellows of the Institute of Politics at, at different times, and I suppose they were at uh, different sides of the building. Um, <laughs> Bob, you have 15 minutes to uh, make your presentation. I, uh, I was going to begin with a, with a fat girl joke, too, but George uh, unfortunately stole my material. Uh, George's, uh, George's presentation may have uh, struck you as reasonable, uh, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about his book in case you haven't read it uh, before going on to, uh, to Reaganomics. Uh, it's it's quite a remarkable book, really. Uh, he he goes well beyond uh, Adam Smith. Uh, Smith <laughs> Smith was content to uh, defend the free market um, in terms of its utilitarian value. Uh, George finds this uh, singularly uh, unsatisfying and. Uh, builds on that and really defends the free market, uh, such as it is, uh, in terms of its transcendent virtue, that uh, capitalism is not only uh, utilitarian, but uh, it's also altruistic. And uh, I want to read for a moment from scripture, because I think you need to hear this unalloyed. Um, giving, he says, giving is the vital impulse and moral center of capitalism. Uh, are capitalists greedier than doctors or writers or professors of sociology or assistant secretaries of energy or commissars of wheat? Yes, their goals seem more mercenary, but this is only because money is their very means of production, just as the sociologist requires books and free time and the bureaucrat needs arbitrary power, the capitalist needs capital. It is no more sensible to begrudge the entrepreneur his profits or ascribe them to overweening avarice than to begrudge, begrudge the writer or professor his free time and access to libraries, or the scientist his laboratories and assistants, or the doctor his power to prescribe medicines and perform surgery. Um, well, uh, from the invisible hand, uh, George goes on to the invisible gland. Uh, economic advance uh, is a function of uh, the male sexual drive, which is sublimated into productive purposes when men are tied up with the traditional nuclear family, and only then. And uh, any attempts to uh, create a more egalitarian family structure um, are destructive of economic purposes because, as George says, uh, the male finds himself cuckolded by the welfare state, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, Mr. Gilder also uh, rehabilitates Say's Law. Uh, this was uh, a proposition of an early 19th century French economist who claimed that uh, supply creates its own demand. And uh, if you wonder about that, you might go down to your local Buick dealer and uh, <laughs> inquire whether, uh, whether supply creates its own demand. Um, George also, uh, in this book, I, I really recommend the book. I mean, I spent the last couple of days cooped up with it, taking notes on it, uh, and it's, it is a marvel. It is Promethean. Um, from Say's Law uh, and the, the ennobling, uh, overarching uh, uh, virtue of, of capitalism, uh, he goes on to talk about poverty. And uh, it's his contention that uh, poverty is the result of the modern welfare state, uh, which is rather remarkable when you realize that uh, industrial poverty of the 19th century uh, antedated the modern welfare state by at least three quarters of a century. And uh, if you want to get into that uh, in the question and answer period, I would, for one, be interested to know uh, how the welfare state could have caused poverty when the period of the modern welfare state has been a period of uh, vast economic growth and uh, an enormous amount of poverty existed uh, before the welfare state. He um, even suggests that uh, the Great Depression was caused in anticipation of the Smoot-Hawley tariff. 
that manufacturers uh, in 1929, presumably anticipating that Congress in its stupidity would pass the Smoot-Hawley tariff in 1930, uh, caused the, uh, the stock market to crash. Um, anyway, uh, let me uh, let me turn for a moment from from uh, Gildernomics to uh, to Reaganomics, uh, and uh, one of the interesting phenomenons that I have found phenomena that I have found in being on panels with supply siders is that they seem to be um, falling all over each other to disown Reaganomics. Uh, I was on a panel with uh, Robert Lakashman and uh, Jude Winiski, and uh, Lakashman launched into a wonderfully witty. Uh, savaging of, uh, of Reaganomics, and uh, 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 Winiski got up and said, I agree with everything. He said, the monitorists screwed it up. You know, if we'd only, if we'd only had pure supply-side tax cuts and the monitorists hadn't loused it up, uh, we would have had uh, all of this great uh, increase in, in um, productive uh, uh, energy and uh, savings and all the other good things that are promised by supply-side economics. Um, but I think we ought to uh, hold the, uh, to the supply siders uh, to their, uh, to their uh, earlier claims. Uh, I'm looking for a, yes, a quote. Uh, here he's taking issue uh, with the, with the um, claim that huge tax cuts uh, might increase the deficit. And uh, he says, Actually, uh, Kemp Roth, the, the across-the-board tax cut, would expand savings sufficiently to finance the deficit. No one seemed to have uh, thought of that, and no one could deny the, uh, the possibility. Now, uh, the fact is, as we all know, that uh, contrary to uh, George Gilder's figures, uh, we did have a massive tax cut last year. Uh, we not only had a cut in personal rates, but we had a, a huge cut uh, in corporate taxes. Corporate taxes are now um, something like 5% uh, of, uh, of federal uh, revenues compared to 20% uh, uh, only a couple of decades ago. And um, we had an enormous cut uh, in, in corporate as well as personal taxes. Uh, that's where the deficit came from. Uh, the deficit did not come from an increase in social programs because, as we all know, social programs have been cut enormously. The deficit came from a tax cut. And uh, if you look at the question of savings rates, why savings are, are depressed, uh, there are several sources of savings. Uh, individual household savings are one source. Corporate profits are another source. Um, public sector savings or dis-savings are another source. Obviously. If you have a misguided tax policy that uh, gives away revenues, doesn't produce any economic benefits in return, as this tax cut did, uh, and you have $120 billion worth of public sector dis-savings, which is what we have, uh, that is going to have a depressing effect on the savings rate. Uh, if you have uh, uh, depreciation policies that um, save corporations uh, billions of tax dollars, whether or not the investments they make are productive. Uh, if you have tax write-offs, uh, like the so-called all-saver certificates that simply subsidizes the savings and loan industry and shifts savings from one financial intermediary uh, to another uh, and costs a couple of billion dollars a year of tax revenues but has no net increase in the savings rate, uh, you're going to increase the, the rate of dis savings because you're, you're increasing the federal deficit by the amount of that tax concession. And you can go through the entire tax bill item by item and uh, go through these various tax giveaways and uh, look at how they fail to engender uh, the savings or the investment uh, that was claimed. And uh, you realize rather quickly that it's not surprising that we have uh, a depression in the savings rate. Uh, it's not surprising in a recession when unemployment uh, is close to 10 percent that no rational corporation is going to invest. And uh, uh, it's not surprising that the whole thing doesn't work. Now, in the couple of minutes I have left, I want to talk about uh, what I stand for and, and why it's a little bit at odds with Reaganomics. 
It seems to me that um, what this debate is really all about is uh, the question of what sorts of social bargains are possible, uh, whether the only way to have a dynamic economy uh, is to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. Uh, George Gilder and the supply siders, and George says it in so many words, he says uh, the poor need the spur of their own poverty. And if you redistribute, uh, if you make the lot of the poor easier, uh, you're really doing them a disservice because um, you're removing the incentive that their poverty gives them. Uh,
disposable personal savings, which are crucial to the emergence of small businesses, which are uh, the driving force in economic growth in all countries. Uh, the, uh, there are 15 million small businesses in the United States. There are about twice as many, incidentally, in Japan, and uh, which uh, has, in general, a more competitive economy than we do. Uh, and uh, tax rates about half as high. And I think the crucial thing to understand is that abandonment of supply-side economics does not open the way to some marvelous alternative of steady, uh, steadily growing economic opportunity and growth. It will uh, result in the uh, triumph in the world economy of uh, the capitalists in Asia who uh, are uh, rapidly achieving dominance through the persistent pursuit of supply-side economics. Uh, the entire Japanese achievement between 1956 when Tanzan Ishibashi, who was the real founder of supply-side economics, uh, enacted the biggest tax cut in Japanese history has uh, been a persistent uh, pursuit of tax cuts year after year. Every year, uh, revenues increased. Every year, savings increased. And, uh, and the result was the fastest economic growth in uh, the history of economic statistics. This idea that there was a devastating cut in social programs in the United States is also false. Uh, during the first uh, four months of uh, this year, transfer payments rose 17 percent, exclusive of Social Security increases. In other words, there's been a more rapid increase in uh, social programs under President Reagan than under uh, President Carter. Uh, the, there has not been any radical dismantling of the welfare state. And, uh, uh, one, uh, and uh, the references to Europe and their uh, great achievements with expanded uh, social policy uh, and uh, better unemployment rates and everything ignore the fact that uh, during, all during the 1970s, the workforces in most European countries declined or just rose by a minuscule degree. They actually declined in Germany, while the United States uh, accommodated 12 million immigrants at least, as well as uh, uh, increasing the level of total employment to 61 percent of uh, the civilian work workforce, which it's adult population which is the highest in uh, peacetime history. It has now dropped back to 58 percent, but uh, that's still higher than it's been uh, in, uh, in most uh, peacetime years in American history, and far higher than is maintained in all these European countries that just send their poor home. They have all these uh, uh, Arbeiter and workers in Germany, and they sent home 400,000 of them late in uh, 19... Uh, uh, late in the 1970s, so did France. They dispatched a whole bunch of Algerians home. Uh, this is how they've uh, dealt with the problem of unemployment. Uh, and uh, today, uh, these countries are all uh, suffering from a crisis of social policy. And as a matter of fact, in Sweden, where the illegitimacy rate has just risen to 40% uh, compared, compared to 12% in the United States, they are in a terrible crisis, with, uh, uh, and, uh, which has led Gunnar Myrdal, the, the architect of Swedish social policy, to uh, say that, uh, uh, that, that, that it's become a failure in Sweden. And uh, in general, however, it's a mistake to suppose that the United States has a lot of latitude for increasing government spending up to the levels in Europe. The, the, re the entire reason for the higher levels of nominal government spending in Europe is nationalized medicine. You, uh, you eliminate nationalized medicine from the total, and uh, American, uh, uh, and, uh, American medical care is performed by uh, large, uh, uh, allegedly private bureaucracies and insurance schemes that operate very much like the national health in a lot of European countries, if that is in its economic impact but exclusive of medical care, and we spend more on medical care than any of these other countries uh, as a share of GNP, uh, the, uh, uh, the United States spends just as much as Germany and Britain and most of these other European countries. And that is uh, 
and uh, we do not have a lot of latitude. There's a general world crisis of the welfare state, and the only uh, uh, way to, to uh, respond to this crisis is to recognize its failure and proceed in other directions. And one policy that uh, Bob mentioned is child allowances, and I'm, fully, I'm a full advocate of it. I'll, uh, if you want to ask questions, I'll uh, talk about that. Okay, Bob, do you want to take five minutes? I talked before about different sorts of theories. I guess it might be good for a moment to talk about just data, facts. Uh, I don't know whether we're talking about uh, fiscal 1981 or calendar 1981 or what, but uh, the tax cut became effective during 1981. And uh, if we're talking about the fiscal 1981, most of, most of fiscal 1981 happened before the tax cut became substantially effective. The reality is that there were massive cuts bottom line cuts uh, in corporate taxes uh, in the first year uh, of, the, of the Reagan tax program. And uh, these came on top of other cuts uh, in the 1978 law, both in corporate taxes and capital gains taxes, uh, which for about a year on the capital gains cuts did produce slight increases in revenue, uh, but have not since. And uh, uh, we're also seeing substantial cuts uh, in personal taxes. Now, uh, if you make under $30,000 a year, uh, it is true that the combined effect of so-called bracket creep, the fact that inflation pushes you into higher brackets, uh, coupled uh, with the slight increase in payroll taxes, leaves you paying a slightly higher tax rate. But if you make over $30,000 a year, uh, you find yourself with a very nice tax cut, and the richer you get, uh, the bigger the tax cut is. I don't know of anybody else on the planet who's challenged that data. Uh, secondly, of uh, Virginia, there have been cuts in social programs. Uh, there's been a, a 30 percent cut in, in federal aid to education. There has been a, a $3 billion cut in aid to families with dependent children. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but there's been a substantial cut in Medicaid. Uh, the administration wanted to cut Social Security, and the Congress uh, wouldn't let them. Uh, at least to the extent of deferring the, uh, the cost of living increase. Uh, if there has been uh, a 17 percent increase in transfer programs, I, for the uh, love of Reagan, would like to know, uh, unless we're counting the Pentagon or aid to El Salvador, um, what kinds of transfer programs uh, unemployment. Unemployment, well, unemployment unemployment comp. And food uh, all right. That's, uh, <laughs> thank you, Ben. That's in character. Um, now, I recently looked at some OECD statistics on public expenditures in Western Europe and the United States, and it is simply not true that national health insurance uh, accounts for the difference. Moreover, to slide over that and say that uh, if you were to assume uh, health spending, which is private in this country and public in Europe, if you were to hold that constant, uh, we're more or less in the same ballpark. Uh, let's accept that for the sake of argument for the moment. But look at the different distributional consequences. Look at the different distributional consequences. If you have national health insurance, everybody basically gets the same standard of health care. If you have a private health system where some people have health insurance, uh, people uh, in the primary labor market who have fairly generous uh, health policies and they get decent care, and affluent people who can uh, afford to supplement that out of their pockets uh, get decent care. And 20 or 30 uh, uh, million people who don't have private health plans and who don't qualify for Medicaid because the conservatives in Congress for 15 years have been chipping away at the eligibility levels, uh, they don't get anything. And uh, poor people get an inferior standard of, uh, of care uh, courtesy of hospital emergency rooms or Medicaid. To call that equivalent, uh, uh, is sort of an affront, it seems to me. Uh, it may be equivalent in some sense of, uh, of national income uh, accounts or, or what have you, but in terms of who gets care, uh, in terms of the, of the equity of the distribution of, of, of medical care, uh, it's hardly the same thing. And that, of course, is why you need social overhead in certain areas. That is why 
Uh, there are certain things the market simply won't do. Now, I just, I cannot resist calling attention to a few other uh, factual lapses. But only in a minute. In a minute. Um, Mr. Gilder says that the, that the average American worker pays a marginal tax rate of close to 50%. Well, he doesn't. It's nothing like that. It's not even 30%. Uh, he says that the average welfare family of four uh, gets benefits totaling $18,000 a year. They don't. They don't. Uh, unless you count the, the uh, in-kind contribution value of the pavement that you walk on and the, the clean air that you breathe, uh, that's more than the, the average family of four uh, off of welfare gets. And um, the AFDC levels plus food stamps plus the cash value of Medicaid plus a reasonable value of public housing add up to less than $10,000 a year for a family of four. Those numbers are just uh, uh, out of this world. Um, uh, I guess I better stop. Huh? All right. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll I think we'll uh, open for questions now. Since I'm in the chair, I get to ask the first question if I want, which I do. Uh, and I I'd like to uh, to ask both panelists. It seems to me that there's probably agreement among both panelists. Maybe not, but I suspect there's agreement uh, that the economy at this point is probably not in great shape. Uh, given the, the interest rates and the, and the unemployment rates and so on, and that perhaps we have some other problems as well. And I'd like to ask each of them what they think are the four or five most important things to do now, or two or three. Um, an appropriate answer is nothing, uh, but I would like to get some sense of, of where both panelists think the, the important things to do are now. I'd say the, the crucial policies are uh, to have real tax cuts on personal income. And I'm very excited by the prospect of Democrats uh, entertaining the idea of a flat tax. I mean, uh, some of the most ambitious young Democrats, like Bill Bradley and Songus and and uh, uh, Gary Hart, are uh, proposing various forms of a flat rate tax or drastic reductions in uh, marginal tax rates. And it's a thrilling development. It means that even though the Democrats won't let Reagan have tax cuts, we've won the debate. Is f on the facts, and uh, that uh, uh, we will now move toward uh, personal income tax cuts, and that's very exciting. So I, a flat tax is the first policy. The second policy is uh, a real effort to avoid protectionism. This is just a v vital. The one thing that can cause a real econ world economic collapse is an outbreak of uh, protectionist policies, and it seems to me that uh, this is the most potent danger of the next uh, few years, and I hope we uh, avoid it. The, and uh, I don't claim that the Reagan administration has been marvelous in this regard, except in its rhetoric. Uh, the, and the third is child allowances. I think that it's absolutely imperative that we get away from a welfare program that uh, increases the income of the poor at the expense of destroying their families, because uh, the family is the central unit of, of economic growth. And it's uh, without it, uh, there is no way that the poor can escape poverty. And uh, any pov set of poverty programs that destroys families uh, increases and uh, intensifies poverty. And so I th and child allowances go to all, uh, all families and could be phased in by phasing out the current uh, uh, child deduction, which uh, has uh, virtually evaporated, which is valuable only for in, uh, taxpayers in top brackets, and uh, the and uh, by eliminating the daycare subsidy, so, well, mother can, uh, which is uh, now a 900 a tax credit of 960 bucks for uh, two kids, and I, uh, the mother should be able to decide whether she uses daycare. She can use her child allowances to get daycare if she wants, but she shouldn't forego that credit uh, by uh, the choice of uh, raising her kids herself. And uh, so I think those are the three crucial programs. Good. Can I get you to answer that, Mr. Bell? Yeah. I, I think the first uh, thing that's necessary is, is a substantial cut in interest rates. Uh, I think if the, uh, if the Fed won't do that across the board, which it ought to, uh, then I think we need some form of credit conservation where you take away the tax advantages for speculative uses of credit, where you give priority to productive uses of credit, uh, productive investment, small business. Um, housing. Uh, you need uh, uh, 
a, a real employment policy, it seems to me, to, uh, to get the uh, unemployment level down. Uh, you need a real old-fashioned public works program to rebuild some of the decaying infrastructure that we have and uh, create jobs uh, while we do it. And uh, I think we need a different form of social, social contract with labor. Uh, I think uh, we have to start uh, thinking of ways in which um, the economy can become more innovative and more productive uh, without individual workers being made to pay the price of that innovation in the form of losing their jobs, in the form of plant closing, uh, in the form of having to choose between uh, givebacks and uh, layoffs and uh, shutdowns. And I think, again, if you had a, uh, a European-style a social contract between labor and capital, where you had a more participatory workplace, uh, where you had labor uh, more involved uh, in corporate decisions, and you had a kind of a social bargain where labor was more receptive to, uh, to uh, productivity innovations in exchange for some guarantees that individual workers would not pay the price of those uh, innovations, um, then you would both have a more secure workforce uh, and a more productive workforce. Uh, and uh, you would have everybody pulling in the same direction on behalf of, uh, of productivity. As far as tax reform is concerned, uh, Bradley does not uh, uh, support uh, a flat tax. He has a flat enough for me. Well, he uh, he has a rather opportunistic uh, phrase that he calls a progressive flat tax. Uh, the the flat tax movement uh, confuses two policy goals. It confuses tax simplification and loophole closing, which progressives have long uh, supported and which business groups have long opposed, uh, it confuses that goal with the goal of tax, um, uh, w with the goal of, of incidence, with the question of whether you have a graduated rate structure or a flat rate structure. And uh, what Bradley did was to hop on board the editorial enthusiasm for the flat tax and uh, to use that uh, idiom to uh, promote uh, tax simplification, but Bradley's uh, proposed rate schedule is graduated. So uh, I think it would be wonderful if we could uh, close all of the loopholes that Mr. Gilder and the supply siders have opened up, and in exchange we could all get some tax <laughs> relief. Okay, let's, uh, let's open for questions from the floor. Can I ask you when you're asking a question to uh, speak loudly and uh, direct your question to whoever you wish to? Um, we at the, in the, the panel can't see people up in the balcony. The Pardon me? Can you read from the mic? That would probably be the easiest way to, to go. Why don't we go from, why don't people who want to ask questions uh, position themselves and we'll go in order from one mic to the next if that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, let's start on the right. Uh, gentlemen, I think both of you would be in agreement that we need to reduce the interest rates uh, since I hope both of you passed your basic economic courses you uh, will realize that we need to increase the uh, personal savings to do such. In Japan, where savings is 19%, they uh, have a, uh, an economy that's working. Here, where it's 5%, it's not. What do you do to propose uh, we increase our uh, personal savings? That's my first question. And my second question is, uh, a simple yes or no answer would be fine. Which one of you believes in the free enterprise system? A yes or no answer to that one, eh? Bob, do you want to start on that one? Can I take the first one first? Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, there are a lot of ways to increase the savings rate. This is one of the great misunderstood issues. Um, the German economy and the Japanese economy finance their industries mostly by loans, uh, bank debt, uh, bank financed uh, loans. And uh, if you do that, it really doesn't matter where your savings come from. Uh, the, um, the Swedes, have a much lower uh, personal savings rate than we do, but on balance they have a higher savings rate because they fund their social security system. They, they operate their national social security system uh, like a private pension fund, and they have a huge uh, volume of social security reserves. So uh, moreover, a lot of the European countries have, have run uh, public sector surpluses uh, many years. The Germans were, were very good at this, and that's a form of savings. So first of all, you don't need very high personal savings rates to have high aggregate savings rates. And secondly, you don't need great disparities of wealth and income in order to have high personal savings rates. You can have uh, all kinds of plans that uh, encourage savings on the part of less wealthy individuals, and uh, you, you, get the, um, you get the same outcome. Now, uh, 
do I believe in the uh, in the free enterprise system? Uh, <laughs> Uh, gee, I, I, I uh, you know, George quotes Schumpeter's famous uh, remark about uh, capitalism being creative destruction, and uh, I think there are, there are things that capitalism does very well. Uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, it produces all kinds of uh, new products. Uh, it produces growth, uh, and there are some things that capitalism uh, does terribly. Uh, it produces horrendous dislocation. Uh, it produces a great human cost. It produces unacceptable disparities of wealth and income, and uh, you don't, you know, you don't have to eat your meat raw. Uh, you can have uh, some of the benefits of the discipline of the marketplace, and, and you can have a much more egalitarian society than Mr. Gilder would settle for. So, uh, uh, I don't think there's so a simple yes answer to that. Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> well, the chief. Uh, uh, I do f focus on uh, disposable personal savings because it's those that kind of savings that's available to small businesses. And, uh, and uh, what's been happening in many countries is a shift of savings from uh, disposable personal uh, facilities to uh, various institutional forms. This uh, did not happen so much in Japan where uh, they, uh, where even though the, the savings actually are controlled by the government in uh, the postal savings system. Most of the savings is done through uh, the <laughs> post office in Japan. Nonetheless, this money is available. It's disposable. It's available to individuals to use in starting small businesses. And uh, that's why there are more small businesses in Japan than in any other country in the world. The way to get interest rates down, the best way, is to uh, stop taxing the returns from savings at uh, more than 100%. And this is what we've been doing for decades. What we've been, uh, or for the last decade, we've been taxing the real returns from savings at more than 100%. Uh, that is, uh, that uh, most of the interest that uh, we've been receiving is in fact inflation. It's not uh, a real return, it's an inflationary return. And uh, when you uh, tax this uh, false return, it uh, means that you end up uh, most of the time t taxing the real return at more than 100%. Meanwhile, we, s we subsidize borrowing in the same way, and this combination of punishing savings and subsidizing borrowing results in uh, high interest rates. Uh, and uh, last year, if you had money in a money market fund and uh, got 14%, uh, and we had 8.9% inflation, that uh, you got the 14% if you're in the 50% bracket, you had to pay, uh, you were left with 7% return uh, compared to eight and a, uh, I think 8.9% inflation. So you lost money by saving even in 1981. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is the problem. In, uh, in most countries, they do not tax uh, interest income at anywhere near the levels we do in our crazed desire to redistribute income and thus destroy wealth. You believe in the free enterprise system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, I thought that. <laughs> I, I'm surprised that neither speaker referred to our unique adversarial legal system in which 600,000 lawyers and millions of associated bureaucrats and others profit by literally generating anti-productive chaos. I wondered if it's possible that no matter what economic system, it's impossible for this country to survive in uh, world competition while bearing this uh, unproductive burden. Couldn't agree more. You know, n neither of us is a lawyer, neither of us is an economist. <laughs> That's a pity. <laughs> question over here. Okay, I have a brief comment and then a question. Uh, Mr. Gilder, I found your um, obscene scenario of little black girls getting themselves inseminated and then having Uncle Sam act as their pimp in setting up their apartments and getting them all the uh, fringe benefits and goodies as a typical uh, Republican put down. And uh, it really is, <laughs> it's immoral, it's obscene, and I think it's really disgusting. Do you have a question? Okay, yes I, I do. I, I agree, I agree entirely. Then why did you say it? 
What about all the little girls in Sweden who, wait a minute, uh, what about all the little girls in Sweden who uh, comprise the 40% of illegitimate births? Are they black too? Uh, as opposed to the 55% that you quoted this in this This isn't a country? racial problem. This is a problem of the welfare state. The reason so I mentioned Sweden. Then why did you mention Sweden, black uh, girls in the first place? Because it so happens that all our welfare programs, the war on poverty, focused in the ghetto. This was its goal. This was its test. It, resp it was a, responded to the problem chiefly of black poverty. That was it. That wasn't its. In that uh, it wasn't it, that wasn't its explicit goal, but uh, blacks were the most identifiable and concentrated poor, and as a result, uh, the programs focused on them, and as a result, the devastation was greatest in the black community. Well, that's and this is a, a terrible. Cliche. This was a terrible tragedy, and uh, and and now and now liberals uh, pointing to Sweden uh, without pointing to Sweden say that the response to this is appropriately more abortions, more family planning, more uh, w welfare support, uh, the more, uh, more sex education. And uh, Sweden has had all these uh, programs for 20 years. It has by far the most elaborate uh, programs of sex education, the most available abortions and contraceptives, the widest propagation of, of feminist policy of any country in the world. And the result is the illegitimacy rate rose from 10% to 40%. And if, if I don't see in the face of the experience in Sweden a white society, one of the richest countries in the world as a result of earlier capitalist achievements, now uh, uh, achieving... So what went wrong? Uh, well, you, you, uh, what went wrong is the bankruptcy of, uh, of liberal social policy, the idea that... Uh, uh, that uh, redistributing wealth is, uh, is a successful and effective policy. Uh, rewarding family breakdown is a beneficial way of uh, overcoming privation. This is the problem. And, uh, and it's, uh, and it's uh, been a terrible catastrophe in the United States, just tragic. It's the, it's the worst thing that, that's been done in American society since slavery is the destruction of the black family in the inner cities. And it's a terrible tragedy. And until liberals understand how it happened, uh, they're going to complete continue intensifying it. And at a certain point, ignorance becomes vicious. OK, but this is my question, and I'll make it very brief, whichever. Defense spending. Moreover, the administration does not expect to get increases as, as great as they uh, have demanded. Uh, I, w I think it's fair to say all administrations always ask for more, and they expect to negotiate to a uh, more reasonable level, and that is happening now and will uh, happen in the future. Um, the governor of the Commonwealth considers himself a, a booster of economics, and he also feels that the relative strength of the state's economy over the past several years is at least um, in part an indication of, of the success of the tax cutting kind of policies. I was wondering if you could each comment on is, is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts better off for the um, economic and, and tax policies that we followed here over the past several years? Um, is it a supply side laboratory? I was reminded earlier on of the debate, which I suppose many of you saw, between Mike Dukakis and uh, uh, Ed King and Tommy O'Neill, where the, uh, the debates were over, uh, no, they weren't taxes. Yes, they were taxes. No, they were your taxes. Let's not get into, let's not get into that. Bob, you want to? Um, I don't think it is. I mean, I think, I think um, first of all, the um, level of taxation at the state level has been shown by study after study after study to um, not be a very significant uh, influence on business decisions. Uh, I think the, um, the distribution of taxes is uh, a far more uh, salient issue to the average voter, uh, as Prop 2.5 suggests. And uh, this has been a state where taxes have fallen uh, very, very heavily on the, uh, the poor and the um, the lower middle class. Uh, I think the success of the high tech sector uh, of, of the state's economy um, has a lot more to do with um, 
some of the universities here and the critical mass effect when uh, an industry uh, takes root. Uh, this was incubating uh, long before uh, the present uh, administration took over. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't think Massachusetts uh, is a laboratory case of uh, the success of uh, supply-side economics any more than the United States of America is a laboratory case of the failure of it. Well, I'd, uh, I'd more or less uh, agree with some of that, although almost all my, the corrections of statistics, uh, of my, the statistics that I use tonight, almost all are in uh, wealth and poverty. Their sources are in the footnotes. They are c accurate statistics, uh, and uh, you can explore them later. So, it, But uh, this statistic I'm not certain about, but I... But, I, but there has been a very uh, large increase in revenues. I think it's 17 percent since uh, two and a half. It's been an unexpected growth in revenues in the state, and it did accord uh, almost precisely with the predictions of one economist and, uh, and uh, violated the predictions of all the others. And the one economist who predicted almost exactly the increase in revenues that occurred in Massachusetts was Arthur Laffer. And uh, I think uh, it isn't uh, the high-tech uh, people themselves are f eagerly willing to credit uh, the, uh, uh, the revival of the economy to the uh, more favorable tax policy, which has been followed in recent years. And uh, I think that uh, we should take their word for it. Of course, education is absolutely vital and indispensable to economic growth, particularly technical education, and that does account for the, uh, er, the creation of these businesses, but their very rapid growth in recent years is partly attributable to the adoption of uh, supply-side economics. Okay, uh, Mr. Gilder, you're quoted in today's Boston Globe, and this is my first question, is saying that the only, poor need only, only one question, so choose. Oh, okay. Uh, you're quoted in today's uh, Boston Globe as stating that the poor need a revival of religion. And I was wondering why you think they do. Well, because uh, among the, uh, the effects of the welfare state dominating poor communities, when, uh, when uh, people are oriented chiefly toward the state, uh, the state is above all prohibited from uh, uh, propagating moral ideas. The state uh, cannot uh, 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 propagate policies, for example, that specifically in enforce uh, conventional family morality. And uh, I think that uh, unless families uh, do stay intact, unless there is uh, a strong family structure, economic growth is virtually impossible. Uh, you c if these female-headed families struggling with kids and the street cannot conceivably uh, escape poverty. Very f almost none of them can escape poverty. So the, to the extent that uh, our social programs produce uh, female-headed families, they uh, uh, intensify poverty. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is our chief, chief problem. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Did I answer the question? Why did the poor need religion was the question. Oh, oh yeah, the religion, it, it's uh, the, this whole idea that the problem of the poor is income, when their incomes have steadily increased for the last uh, uh, two decades uh, to a level higher than the median income in America in 1960, and, uh, you know, higher than, uh, this is true, uh, that, and uh, uh, to the extent that uh, the entire lower middle class in America could do better, by g the entire uh, second quintile could do better, by uh, going on welfare. Uh, they'd all do better if, uh, if the welfare state and great society uh, social workers explained their real economic options, uh, at least in the short run, uh, the entire, uh, and uh, this, is a, this is a real disaster. And uh, the churches, when they uh, chiefly adopt materialism and, and imagine that the chief problem of the poor is income, betray their real role in society, which is to uh, uphold uh, uh, the moral and spiritual foundations of uh, human family and, uh, and uh, civility. And I, I think that's, uh, that's why I think that the destruction of the culture in the inner cities is as serious a problem as the uh, general dis uh, chaos that's been created there. Do you want to comment on this one? Sure, just a couple of comments on, on families. 
um, first of all, it's it's awfully hard to, uh, to uh, attribute uh, the breakup of families uh, to uh, welfare programs targeted at the poor when we've had divorce rates soaring uh, throughout uh, society at, at every income level. And uh, unless you believe that we also have a welfare state for the rich, uh, which we may, uh, it's really hard to explain the divorce rate among the rich in terms of the abuses of the welfare state. Secondly, um, if the Reagan people are concerned about uh, the family in the inner city, uh, you really have to wonder why they're changing the welfare uh, regulation in a way that uh, really hurts the working poor most of all. I mean, after all, the working poor uh, where you have uh, one or two wage earners making minimum wage, um, earning slightly above uh, the AFDC, um, the welfare standard of need, uh, up until now uh, have been able to increase their uh, earnings uh, and still qualify for some fraction uh, of, a, of a reduced welfare grant, and perhaps for Medicaid. Well, now, under the Reagan changes, um, not only uh, are these people thrown back on the welfare system so that you have a disincentive to work, uh, but that in turn uh, creates a situation where you have more family breakups, where you have more privations, where you have more red tape, where you have more demands that mothers uh, leave children at home uh, to take uh, menial make work jobs uh, or lose their grant uh, without any kind of decent uh, daycare. Uh, you have all kinds of cuts in programs that are, are quite well proven, like the Women and Infants and Children Program, uh, the uh, Aid to All Handicapped Children Program, which really do concrete uh, things for, uh, for poor families. And um, it's awfully hard to know how any of these cuts uh, are, are going to help these poor families. It's also awfully hard to see how, by themselves, uh, these program cuts are going to, are going to uh, do anything about the teenage pregnancy epidemic. You want to respond to that? Yeah. The, the first thing uh, to say is this, this is another example of liberal denial. You know, here we have 88% of white families are intact, uh, uh, while 42% uh, 42, 42 of black, no, I'm sorry, 56% of, of, of black families are intact. And uh, we have a white illegitimacy rate of 9%, a black illegitimacy rate of 55%. And this uh, doesn't include middle class black families, which are just like middle class white families. They're just as stable and, and uh, operate, earn just as much money these days as uh, comparable white families. And their uh, incomes continued to rise at, uh, throughout the 70s at, uh, by 11%. Uh, this, while uh, white real family incomes rose about 3%. Uh, it's, uh, it's this catastrophe in the inner city, which is not comparable to upper class divorces, where you end up with a total uh, family catastrophe. And it's, uh, you know, if, uh, when uh, there's this level of illegitimacy, it's a catastrophe, because particularly for the, there's, uh, these uh, mothers cannot deal with boys. They cannot socialize their boys, and they lose their boys to the streets. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's in general true. Uh, you, you go and I, I spent three years interviewing these mothers. I spent, spent three years uh, interviewing people in Harlem, South Bronx, Greenville, South Carolina, and, and uh, Albany trying to determine just what was going on with the welfare state. And uh, they agree. They won't laugh when you tell them that they have trouble dealing with their boys, keeping them off the street, getting involved in drugs and gangs. They will emphatically agree with you. And uh, that is, uh, it's, it's only upper class whites who laugh about the dis dissolution of the family. No, Bob, they do, do, Bob, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> I mean, do you have, want to pick that up at all? No. No? Okay. I think we have only time, I'm afraid, for, for one last question, so we'll take it from over here. Thank you. I'm Tom Walton, I'm a uh, chemical engineer from Brookline. And I'm very interested in what's going on in this country and in the world. It's kind of a hobby of mine. And <laughs> good, we're pleased. I'm very interested. I was, I was very concerned that neither of you commented on the collapse of the 1.7 trillion dollar euro dollar. Okay, over in Europe, 
which is which threatens to collapse our whole economy. Well, I mean, this is a drastic a situation. Okay, the euro dollars. I think as many people from the business school know, are dollars that are lent. Okay, to banks in in London, in uh, Italy, et cetera, banks all over the place. All right. This, this, this money, this money is transferred from bank to bank in loans, okay, right. in what's called a banking multiplier, okay. Now here your, your in the U.S. we have a banking multiplier yeah, of about three. You're talking three. about something that hasn't happened. Now it's always possible that uh, banks can I finish, can please? Fail. Can I finish? In the U.S. we have a banking multiplier of about three, okay. With this euro dollar scandal, there's a banking multiplier of about six to ten, okay. Six to ten times that one dollar invested in a loan is reused by banks from bank to bank, you know, Italy, France, you know, from debt to debt, okay? One point seven trillion dollars worth, okay? And right now these banks, a lot of them are going bankrupt. Banco Ambrosiano recently uh, went bankrupt because of this reason. One of them is going bankrupt. To, to a so tremendous amount time. of money. And others are going to follow suit. And what, what I found out anyhow is that the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker, okay, is going to bail out the euro dollar. He's going to try to bail out the euro dollar to this trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars worth of phony money that's floating around. What do you think this is going to do to our economy? Okay, when we try to bail out think, think, to this tone of money, okay, by printing money no. through the Fed. Well, if, if uh, we did have a collapse of the euro dollar, it would be a very serious event. However, it's been predicted year after year after year for the ever since the initial uh, oil crisis of 1973, when it was uh, when uh, uh, the petrodollars uh, began to expand at such a huge pace, and everybody said that the banks couldn't possibly recycle the petrodollars; that you'd need some massive international uh, agency to accomplish this goal. And, uh, but the fact is that uh, the banks did succeed very well in recycling the euro dollars to less developed countries, and that their uh, economies, although they are troubled, uh, still have uh, grown very rapidly during the last decade, and uh, probably offer a, a promise of paying the vast uh, back the vast um, proportion of their of their debts. And I don't think the euro dollar is likely to collapse any more, more than it was supposed to uh, produce a world depression in 1973. What have, have we right now? Do you have anything to What's say? going on right now over in Europe? A recession. And threatens to happen right a, here in this there's country. There's a serious recession. Uh, things, uh, serious recession or serious depression in Europe? Well, uh, during, the, uh, during the 1930s when we had a, a depression, uh, unemployment rates were 30 percent, 20 and 30 percent. And employment rate in the United States was 46 percent in the 1930s. Now it's 58 percent. Uh, Lester Thurow goes around saying we're already in a Great Depression, but uh, they're just—it's just not comparable. We are not in a depression. We're in a transition to uh, the computer age, as uh, you probably understand. That uh, we're at the transition uh, to. Uh, uh, the solution of our crucial world problems. One is the energy crisis, which I think is essentially over now. Uh, last, uh, about, a, about a month ago, they found uh, uh, in Venezuela a new discovery virtually as big as uh, Saudi Arabia's currently uh, identifiable reserves. And, uh, and I think that uh, the energy crisis has been essentially solved by the new ex exploration technologies. And I think we're also uh, about to solve the crucial problems of production through the vast expansion of uh, CAD CAM systems and robotics and the automated uh, factory as well as the electronic office. And this is happening today. Uh, the personal computer industry will have uh, unit sales comparable to the auto industry. In the Thank you for getting years. off the track, but uh, well, I'm, okay, I'm, that's a. I want to. I want to give Bob a chance to respond to this if he wants to, and then we. Really I, I haven't it. asked the question. The question well, is. Well, I think you did actually. Paul Volcker, do you do you agree with Paul Volcker's he, he didn't say bailout that. of off. printing paper money for these European countries, dishing it into U.S. banks to let to bail out European banks? You're, do you agree with that? You're alleging that he's doing this. He isn't doing this. If we really do, to prevent a real collapse, 
I think there would need to be international cooperation of all the central banks to prevent a real de depression. But I don't think this has happened. It is not uh, going to happen as a result of the failure of the one Italian bank uh, any more than it happened as the result of a failure of a couple of U.S. banks or the uh, failure of the uh, that German bank, the name of which uh, eludes me at the moment, and first that. And uh, the, it's, it just is not a very likely prospect. It could happen, well, in I which case it would be terrible, and uh, th there'd be a world crisis. I, I just want to say that <clears throat> when I agreed to debate, George, the one ground rule was that we would not talk about Euro dollars. Right. So. <laughs> Good. Well, we really do have to close. Uh, I'm sorry that the evening turned out to be so boring for all of you. Uh, and I would like to thank both our panelists very much for coming and, and uh, talking with us this evening. Thanks a lot. Thanks to you all.